on with the show. Hey, everyone, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. My guest today is Stephanie Spencer, and she is not only a registered nurse, but she's a plant-based registered nurse. She's going to be talking a little bit about her experience working in the medical field, and she's going to be doing a fabulous culinary demo, including a smoothie that has like 22 grams. I can't remember if it was protein or fiber, but- Fiber. Fiber, very important fiber. Fiber <laughs> is the new protein. And right. he's also going to be making a savory recipe that I'm really excited about because I, I'm not really familiar a lot with lion's mane, but I hear it's a fabulous ingredient. She's going to be making in air quotes crab cakes. Please welcome from Arkansas, Stephanie to the show. It's very nice to meet you. Oh, please don't be frozen. <laughs> ah, da -da. Oh, we practice this. Well, there we go. It. I can hear you now. Okay. Oh, All right. Goodness. Yeah. Right at the beginning. Okay. Thank you. There you go. Hopefully you won't freeze again. Yeah. Okay. Take it away, Stephanie. All right. Well, thanks for having me on, Chef AJ. Yeah, my name is Stephanie Spencer. Um, I'm an RN. I've been um, a cardiac nurse for about 27 years. I used to run an outpatient heart failure clinic uh, for almost 20 years. And... Um, yeah, it's kind of funny. I had a kind of a crazy path. I, uh, after about 20 years, I was just ready for a change. And so it's a long story, but to make the long story short, I basically sat down one day and said, what do I really want to do with my life? Um, and it wasn't uh, just managing the symptoms of end stage diabetes and heart failure and things like that with no plan to get better. And I wasn't plant-based at the time. Like I didn't even understand anything about that. Um, but I was just kind of unhappy and I was ready for a change. And I thought, you know what, I think I've gotten my money's worth out of my degree. And I kind of heard about this like organic agriculture, like regenerative farming and stuff. And I was just fascinated by that. And so I started looking into it and I happened across this idea of growing microgreens. And um, so one thing led to another, but to make a long story short, I uh, ended up converting a room in my house to uh, growing microgreens, which I'm gonna talk about in my smoothie, but they're just little vegetable seedlings. Uh, they're really nutritious, but then restaurants also use them for garnishes and I grow micro herbs too. So I, I got into the microgreens business. I started selling to restaurants and it's really weird. Right about the same time as I was like moving into food and like healthy stuff, uh, my husband came home from the doctor one day with blood work that showed that he was pre-diabetic. And I was like, oh no, we are not going to be diabetic in this house because all of my patients for my entire adult life, that's what I did was take care of patients that were suffering from the end stage effects of diabetes. And like in my heart failure clinic, I probably had like 250 patients that I was juggling. And I could tell you, I would say if anyone ever didn't have diabetes, it would really stick in my head. I could count on one hand, the number of patients that didn't have diabetes. So all I saw for what I did as a, for a living was patients that were suffering the end stage effects. So I had heard from, I had seen what the health about six months earlier. And, um, and I, that was the first time I ever really heard, you know, like 30 years in the medical field. It was the first time I hear that you can flat out reverse diabetes, a plant-based diet. And Dr. Bernard explains the whole thing with the fat buildup on the muscle cells. And it like, totally made sense to me. So then when my husband comes home later with a pre-diabetes diagnosis, I said, we're going plant-based. <laughs> and prior to that, I have three teenage boys. So prior to that, and like, I had kind of heard about a plant-based diet just peripherally. And I actually saw forks over knives about like 10 years ago, but I, I was like, well, that's good for like, I really like cheese, like everyone. And so after I saw forks over knives, the first time I kind of quit eating meat so much, but I still like a lot of people do this. I kind of like let the dairy thing go right over my head and I kept eating my dairy, but, um, but yeah, so, but once it was relevant to me and Paul had a diagnosis, like I know that diabetes never gets better. All we do is escalate the drugs and then you're going to end up on insulin and then you end up on an insulin pump and then we have wounds and then we're, we're in big trouble. And we have really high risk for um, heart attacks if you have diabetes. So Paul luckily didn't fight me. We just switched to a plant-based diet and I didn't really even know 
nearly what I know now. And so we did the best we could, but uh, within four months, we had reversed his pre-diabetes and he was back within the normal range and we both lost 20 pounds. And so I was absolutely fascinated by plant-based nutrition after, after I saw the dramatic results. Like I kind of thought, I, a lot of people think when you say I'm switching to a plant-based diet, they think it's salads and kale. And I've even had people tell me like, oh, I can't do a plant-based diet. I love carbs too much. I'm like, it's all carbs. <laughs> but at the beginning, like when we started eating, I had never eaten legumes on a regular basis before I was plant-based. So once I started getting like two to three servings of legumes a day, and then my appetite was completely suppressed, and then the weight just started falling off of me and like everything just starts to get better. And then my parents both switched to a plant-based diet. They're in their eighties. Like my dad went off his prostate medicine. Everyone's like arthritis pain gets better. Uh, like blood pressure gets better. It's just amazing. So what I had done in my old job, um, running my, uh, the heart failure clinic that I did, I was with a cardiac specialty hospital. So that's all we like, it's just nonstop people stacked up out to the street with heart failure. And I just, my job was to keep them out of the hospital, I try to treat them on an outpatient basis. The number one expense to the Medicare system is, um, heart failure hospitalizations because people just fill up with fluid from eating junky high sodium food. And then they go into the hospital and it's just over and over and over. So like the Affordable Care Act in 2010 made a mandate that you had to um, control your hospital's heart failure readmission rate or be fined like $3 million a year. So that's what my job was, was to create a program where I could keep people out of the hospital. And so I created this entire heart failure readmission prevention program. It's just a lot of crazy things we have to do when people are that sick. And um, so I'd have like a 30 step process to that I made the nurses do and stuff and they hated me. But um, but yeah, so once I figured out this plant based nutrition, I thought it, it's kind of like heart failure when you work in cardiology, like everyone's got it. Everyone's got like by the time we get to be 50, half the population has prediabetes and diabetes. Everyone's getting a little bit hypertensive. Everyone, the average cholesterol is 200. You know, so I'm like. Well, everyone generally by middle age has these problems of the beginning stages of chronic disease. What if I just created a course where you take your average person that just knows nothing and walk them through the whole process at the beginning? So, and I forgot to back up and tell you, but after I saw the changes that we made, I was kind of red pilled on plant-based nutrition. <laughs> and so I went on and got um, my, my certification uh, from T. Colin Campbell uh, Center for Nutrition Studies. So I'm certified in plant-based nutrition. I learned so much from that course. I can't thank Dr. Campbell enough for putting that together. It's just amazing. Just my jaw draw. I couldn't believe that there's all this stuff that I never knew about like cancer promotion. And we're going to talk more about that when I get to the lion's mane mushrooms. <laughs> but, um, but anyway, yeah. So then I just created a course and I started teaching this course about three years ago. I started just teaching live courses and um, I made it into four classes. So the first class was, where do you get your protein? That's what everyone wants to know. And I, and I was kind of that way too. Like I didn't really understand where you could get your protein. And I wasn't really convinced until I like got the certification and, then, and read the China study. And then I understood it. So I try to present that like right off the bat because people can't even focus on plant-based nutrition until it is clear to them that plant-based protein is infinitely superior to animal-based protein. And so that's the first class. Then the second class is type two diabetes, what causes it and what can reverse it. Uh, and then the third class is um, heart disease. Uh, you're as old as your arteries is the name of the class. And then uh, the fourth class is weight loss. Um, and then, so everyone goes to the class, we have homework, I have an introductory part where they like, they go through, they have a pantry list where they, um, you know, you just go in and buy all the weird things in one shopping trip and you've got everything you need. Uh, we have like a little worksheet where you plug your labs in. I have resources for their physician when they look at them over their half glasses and say, where are you going to get your protein? They just hand in the piece of paper that says the American College of Lifestyle Medicine exists. And, and all the references that they need for that. But, um, but yeah, so it just walks them through, gives them like homework assignments. We have a fiber assignment. We, um, we, and then we just slowly add in 
Uh, and so the whole idea is you transition over four weeks, because I think it's hard for a lot of people to just go cold turkey. So they transition over four weeks. And then we do, I, I call it the 21 day plant-based challenge. And then we take 21 days after you've learned all the cooking skills, you've learned why, and then we dive in for 21 days and um, go 100%, no meat, no dairy, no oil. And then we repeat labs, repeat blood pressure, repeat uh, weight, and compare to previous. And then I always tell them like, after you finish the 21 day challenge, then you can decide what you want to do for the rest of your life. But uh, by then it's pretty clear to them the difference that they've noticed. And I've just, I've heard so many stories that I have never seen in the regular medical field. Like I've had students that, for example, one of my favorite ones, this little lady that was really quite ill and I just like had a hard time getting around. And she said at her doctor's office, there's 10 steps she has to go up to get to the cardiologist's office. And she switched and she said she always had trouble walking up those steps. Like she'd have to go one step at a time and take a break at each step. She said after 10 days of switching to my diet <laughs> after going through my class, she was able, to, so she had a doctor's appointment 10 days later. For the first time, she was just able to walk straight up the steps without a break. And she said her cardiologist was amazed. And he said, he's going to try to start eating beans too. <laughs> and then I've had um, students that uh, like had renal kidney insufficiency, like the beginning stages of kidney deterioration. And that's what my patients used to always die from. You get the heart failure and then you get the kidney failure and then that's it. Like that's, there's really not much worth the end of the road there. And we never know what to do in the medical field when people have uh, like once you get on dialysis, yes, the dietitian is going to start to restrict your protein, but it's not until then. <laughs> like we have plenty of people out there with, with poor kidney function. No one knows to say, stop eating animal protein. But anyway, I had this um, student that had the same thing uh, on her labs that showed that her kidney function was deteriorating. And she just had a, she didn't know, but she just had a vague idea that maybe this plant-based nutrition thing would help. And she asked me about it. And I referred her to how not to die, the kidney section with Dr. Greger's book. And it shows how a plant-based diet can really improve kidney function. Um, because basically your kidneys have to buffer all this acidic animal protein um, to get to, uh, to be equivalent to our bloodstream, which is alkalinic, okay? And um, all that buffering just stresses the kidneys out over time. So yeah, she switched to a plant-based diet, three weeks later, repeated the kidney labs and they were back to normal. And I just saw her two weeks ago and she says, everything is still fine. Her, her labs are all great. So yeah, it's just things like this that like I have never seen get better in the medical field. So it's, it's the most exciting thing I've ever done. Wow. That's incredible, Stephanie. You know, uh, Darlene, who's watching live says, will going plant-based help her congestive heart failure? Yes. Okay. Let me tell you about, let's go on congestive heart failure. So if you have congestive heart failure, what I recommend you do, don't even look at my course. And I do have, my course is available. It's an online course. And if you look in the show notes, um, you can click on it. There's a discount for Chef AJ Live, people that sign up within a week. And then we're also going to have a group coaching session. It says there, I think it's August 4th. That's included with the class. You'll have a group coaching session with me if you sign up. So there's two ways we can do it with heart failure. Okay. <laughs> you can do the easy way, which is Stephanie's way, which is just like, we're going to wrap our heads around this and um, slowly transition over. But let me tell you, if you have heart failure, I highly recommend looking at Dr. Baxter Montgomery. You, I'm sure you know Dr. Montgomery, but montgomerywellness.org, I believe. But he is an electrophysiologist. And so he's basically a cardiologist that does the fancy devices and planted defibrillators and stuff that heart failure patients need. And then he became plant-based and now he specializes in nutritional interventions. So Dr. Montgomery has a, uh, it's like a four week nutritional detox program. And, and he has had really good results. I actually hosted a, um, a Zoom session with him on PBNSG and I was able to ask him every question I had about heart failure. <laughs> and, um, but he's done some case studies and he has gotten patients, heart failure patients that have an ejection fraction of 22%, which is really low. That's that, an ejection fraction is how strong your left ventricle is squeezing. Normal is anywhere from 50 to 60%. That means we're squeezing 50 to 60% of the blood out of the left ventricle 
and the left ventricle then it goes to general circulation after that. Um, so 50 to 60% is normal. Below 20% is where we're at like a, what we call advanced therapy. That's where you're a candidate for a heart transplant or a artificial heart, like a left ventricular assist device. So he got patients with an average EF of 22%, four weeks of his nutritional detox, which he calls it grass and water. And um, at the end of just four weeks, they had the patients had an average ejection fraction of 44%. And that is absolutely unheard of in the regular world. And, and it's interesting, and I'll tell you, speaking of heart failure, because I could talk for forever about that. The only time, I mean, occasionally we'll see heart failure reverse, and it's usually with a, a what we call a toxic cardiomyopathy. Cardiomyopathy is just the fancy word for heart failure. But um, I did have one patient one time that had alcoholic cardiomyopathy. Like alcohol can just flat out cause heart failure in, in high, like she was an alcoholic. So in high enough amounts, um, with like, she didn't have a heart attack. She wasn't hypertensive or anything. She just drank so much alcohol that she went into heart failure. She had the worst heart failure I've ever seen it was an ejection fraction of 5%. And that's all I do is heart failure, right? I'd never seen anyone worse than her. So we clearly sat down with her and said, you have to cut out the alcohol. She did. And over time, it took her like probably about eight months or so. But by God, her heart just rebounded. Because if you take away the toxin, your body will just heal itself. And so um, her ejection fraction came right back up to 55%, right? So it, that just shows that your body is just just wants to heal itself. It's like Dr. Esselstyn says, like if you smash your knuckles with a hammer and then every day you keep smashing it and you ask the doctor, why do your knuckles hurt? Well, it, it, clearly you need to stop smashing yourself with a hammer, right? But if we can take away the toxin, we can fix things. The most common cause, however, like what Darlene maybe have, and I don't know what kind of heart failure she has, um, but half of the heart failure we have is caused by heart attack. So you have a heart attack and then, the, you know, like the muscle, the artery clogs up and then downstream, it doesn't get blood flow. And then that part of the muscle dies. So half of that is from heart attacks. The other half is generally from high blood pressure um, or heart failure. But um, th that's called ischemic heart failure, the heart attack kind. That doesn't ever just get better if you're eating a standard American diet. Okay. And granted, we don't have like randomized controlled trials yet with heart failure in a plant-based diet, but we've got some pretty convincing case studies. And also, I don't know if you're familiar with Mama Says, um, Megan, Don, you've probably interviewed her before too. And this is, um, this is just public knowledge on, on her website, but her mother had heart failure with an ejection fraction of 10%. She was on hospice and Meg like heard something about plant-based nutrition, basically just kind of put her on like the Esselstyn diet. I think she read Dr. Esselstyn's book. And I believe it was when in about six months, she was discharged from hospice and then she just got better and better and better. Finally went back, repeated her echo and her ejection fraction was up to normal 55%. So outside of a plant-based diet and, or outside of removing the toxin like alcohol with alcoholic cardiomyopathy, I've never seen heart failure get better, but it f frequently gets better if you switch to a plant-based diet. Excellent. You're so passionate about what you do. Thank you, Stephanie. <laughs> All right. Or we, you want me to go on to the smoothie? Yeah, we have any yeah, other yeah. You want to do that? I don't know how long the lion's mane takes. So I want to make sure you have enough time. for. Yeah, me. let's go ahead and do the smoothie. So this is my favorite. I eat this every morning. And this is what I like to start my students out with is like, if you switch from a sausage biscuit to this smoothie, your life is going to change. Okay. So the secret of plant-based nutrition is really to just get tons and tons of fiber. That's what's missing from our standard American diet. So we are going to start out with some flax seeds and I've got the recipe in the show notes here, but I just kind of like eyeball it. I put a little bit of flax seeds in. This is great for um, getting your omega threes. And then I put a little bit of steel cut oats. So we're just getting fiber, fiber, fiber here. And I'll tell you, I eat this smoothie every morning. Lots of times my life is so busy. I don't have time to eat lunch. I, this is about as much uh, oatmeal as I put in or steel cut oats. And uh, if I'll have the smoothie usually like at 930. If I get busy, I can go till 5 p.m. I don't even need lunch because it's so filling. Um, so yeah, the oats, we're going to get lots more fiber. And then I'm going to put some amla powder in. Amla is the highest, you about a half a teaspoon 
Um, this is Amla Powder's Indian Gooseberry. It has the highest um, antioxidant capacity basically known to man. And uh, they've uh, done studies and it has about, uh, it'll reduce cholesterol by about 35 to 40% in about three weeks, an amount that is equivalent to six months of statin use. And this costs like, I don't know, $8. So it's just food, but um, yeah, it's really amazing. And then let me tell you what we're gonna put in. I discovered when I switched to a plant-based diet, I was 49. And we all know what happens at middle age, right? <laughs> and so I started kind of going through the change, but and I thought for a couple of years, I'm like, ha ha, it's not that bad. I beat the system because I'm plant-based. But then um, just this year, I started getting hot flashes. And it's funny, right after I started getting hot flashes, I happened to see a video that Dr. Neil Bernard did showing that um, soybeans can decrease hot flashes by 84%, he did a study. And so the um, individuals in the study took one half cup of, I think they did edamame, okay? But I'm gonna tell you what I got here. This is uh, Arkansas soybeans. Uh, soybeans are Arkansas's number one crop. And I have a good friend named Karen Ballard who is a soybean farmer and she's growing non-GMO soybeans and try, she's working with the Mid-South Soybean Board and looking to find um, a, an outlet for selling soybeans to, for human consumption. So her non-GMO soybeans are already pre-sold to Japan and, um, and they use them in like natto or something. But, um, but yeah, so I said, I would love to help you finding a human <laughs> outlet for soybeans. So she's going around like in the Arkansas Delta, which is the really rural part where people rife with chronic disease. And um, she tries to uh, promote the soy. And so like I've, I gave her my course. And so she's learning about plant-based nutrition and how that can help with chronic disease. So anyway, it's really exciting. But so you put the soybeans in. And when I started putting soybeans in my smoothie every morning, my hot flashes just completely decrease. I still have them a little bit, but not enough to even really notice, okay? So what we're gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and mix this up right here. I use just a little bit of almond milk and I, I like to use almond milk um, instead, like yeah, soy milk would give you more of those phytoestrogens to help with the hot flashes, but the taste I, I don't care for as much. So I, I like the almond milk, but you can put whatever plant milk you like. Okay, cover your ears. There we go. Okay, so I like to blend that up first and get it good and mixed in. All right, then I'm going to put, let's talk about microgreens. So this is what I grow. I sell at the farmer's market and I sell them um, at restaurants, but these are my two best sellers. Broccoli sprouts, if you've never used broccoli sprouts before, you they are amazing. I have a link to some research on the broccoli sprouts in the show notes. They target cancer stem cells, they repair DNA damage, they pull carcinogens out of your body. Broccoli sprouts are the highest concentration of this compound called sulforaphane found in nature. And they're studied by Johns Hopkins researchers. So broccoli, you've probably heard Dr. Gregory talk about like hack and hold, something about that. That's to increase the sulforaphane content. That's that anti-cancer. It also does a bunch of other things too. But um, if you get the sprouted version of broccoli, these are just like eight days from the seed, okay? This has a 100 times higher concentration of sulforaphane than mature raw broccoli. So two ounce, or actually one ounce, which is about this much of broccoli sprouts has the same amount of sulforaphane, that cancer fighting uh, chemical as a pound and a half of raw broccoli. So all you need to do is put just a handful of this broccoli sprouts in and you're getting the equivalent of an entire, it's basically like an entire stalk and a half of raw broccoli, okay? So that's my shortcut. And then this is my other bestseller. It's a rainbow mix. It's got 11 different varieties. So it's got like radish, arugula, mustard, celery, kohlrabi, kale, broccoli, beets, amaranth, buckwheat, lettuce, like, and it's all sorts of weird things that you don't normally eat. And, um, you know, like Dr. Um, what's his name? Dr. B, you know, the gastroenterologist, I can't pronounce it. You probably, Dr. Buskowitz, you probably had him on your show too. But anyway, 
he recommends getting 30 different um different varieties of fruits, vegetables, whole grains, and legumes for maximum gut health. So whatever number you can, that's per week. Okay. So I kind of like added my numbers up and like, I kind of eat a lot of the same things. So I had like 22, but you put rainbow mix in just one handful of rainbow mix. You can add 11 to whatever your variety is. So there's the rainbow mix. So I'm going to put that in. I'm going to put some fruit. And this is just the stuff that I like. Um, I put, I always have strawberries and berries are really good for um, cancer prevention. They've got tons of antioxidants. So I've got some strawberries, some raspberries. You can really put any kind of fruit that you want in. Um, it's uh, up to you. And I don't like bananas, so I never put bananas in. I know most people do. It's just like a Stephanie thing that I don't care for bananas. And are we doing okay on time, Chef? We're AJ? doing great. Okay, good. You're like Joe Rogan. I'm so used to always being pressed for time, but we can just sit and talk and talk, right? <laughs> no, we yeah. like to give everybody at least an hour. Hey, one time Dr. McDougall went over four hours, but hopefully that's what he Oh, my goodness. Wow. Today. Yeah. Okay, so I, I usually, so my base fruit is like strawberries, raspberries, and maybe pineapple. If you are diabetic, I recommend doing a half of a date instead of a pineapple, okay? Because a pineapple is a high glycemic fruit. Um, and if you are like taking insulin or something, you'll notice it. But yeah, use a date if, uh, if you're diabetic. And if you're diabetic, you want to sip smoothies slowly over like the course of an hour, okay? Um, but uh yeah. So I, I do my frozen fruit and then I usually just throw in whatever um, fresh fruit is available. Like for a while I was doing blood oranges cause that was the season, but now I've got, I love nectarines. So we got nectarines at the store. So I'm going to throw that in. All right. Nectarines have a lot of uh, moisture too. And just remember, you can always add more plant milk, but you can't take it out if you get too much. So, yeah. And then when you're making a smoothie, you always need uh, some lemon or lime. You need some citrus or it's just going to taste like grass. Okay. So, yeah, citrus is our salt in the plant-based world. So I just get like that much. You can put too much in and then it doesn't taste good. So just, you know, start out with a little. You can always add more. Okay, so we got that. Now I'm going to I'm going to add just a tiny bit of plant milk and cover your ears. We're going to see how this goes. It might take me a couple tries to get it all blended. Good. Okay. Now I've got it. So Stephanie, is there any particular type of plant milk that you prefer? I, for this, I like to use almond milk. And like, once you switch to a plant-based diet, you will develop very strong opinions about plant milk. Um, so like different, I do different plant milks with different things. Like, um, anytime I can, I do soy milk just to get those phytoestrogens because I'm postmenopausal now. But, um, but for this, I just prefer the taste of almond milk. So take that for what it is. All right. And then we're just going to dump this out. Okay. And I'll tell you, for like a year and a half, I mean, like I've done this smoothie every day for three years. But one day I woke up and I used to always put it in a glass and just, drink it with like one of those thick straws. And one day I woke up and I was like, I am so sick of this. I can't, I can't eat it one more time. And then it occurred to me, like, what could I do to make this more exciting? And I'm like, well, what if I made it like a smoothie bowl? <laughs> and so I put it in a bowl, like, here you go. 
And then what happens when you switch to a plant-based diet, you start to really crave crunch because, you know, like when we're eliminating oil, it's hard to get crunch. Right. And so like, you, you think you can do some kind of like, you know, granola thing, it's going to be full of oil. And if you don't have time to make your own or whatever, but I discovered this Ezekiel cereal, it's a sprouted crunchy cereal. There is no oil and it's all made out of sprouted grains and, um, and sprouted grains are really our most superior form of grain. So I just put some on top for a little extra excitement and then we can toss just for variety, just toss some blueberries on top. I don't personally care for blueberries in the smoothie because it kind of like, it turns it all gray and it adds like a different flavor, but I like it on top. Like it's just whatever you like. But anyway, I'm going to try to hold this up. Can you see that? It's, it's gonna beautiful. Start. It's almost yeah, like, so that's, that's it, my it morning. Like those are almost like uh, healthier grape nuts. It's like healthier grape nuts. Exactly. But it's delicious and like it's crunchy. It's just. I am sad if I ever am in a situation where I can't have my smoothie. I, I'm happy to eat this every day. So, so yeah, that's it on the smoothie. And then I'm going to carry you over there and we're going to go do the lion's mane real quick. Uh, I've got my assistant here uh, fixing the lighting. So we, what's, uh, what's the I did a little practice session and my husband had the brilliant idea of bringing his work light in like a stage light and it makes all the difference okay all right can you see me all right there perfect what's the right, plant-based scene like living in arkansas are people what's interested? That? oh what's, what's the well let me tell you um well so i you know like i'm at the farmer's market every day and it's funny because it's totally different from working in a hospital like <laughs> i was of the belief that like just everyone is diabetic <laughs> Out of the farmer's market there's vegans there there's I mean like and I and I also talk about like I have a little flyer about my class and I talk about plant-based nutrition to people a lot there are quite a few vegans and we have we have a really good restaurant scene here um they almost compare it to like Austin we're like the little Austin kind of of the mid-south but um you know we have a really good restaurant scene and we and a lot of the restaurants have really good um vegan options uh, and they're having more and more vegan options. And I keep talking to uh, restaurant owners, like the ones that I sell to. And I've got one that's like, a, it's a Brazilian restaurant and they started doing their uh, beans and rice with no oil even. I'm like, I can set you up if you can have a no oil dish. But um, but yeah, it's, it's really surprisingly uh, not as bad as you would think. So it, it's just coming along bit by bit. So it's uh, pretty exciting, but, and like, I have a, um, an uh, online monthly support group. So we all get together. Like these are all uh, former students. So like when you uh, enroll in my course, then you also automatically get enrolled in our monthly support group. That's just ongoing for forever. And um, we have a book club. Uh, we're going to do how not to die in a couple weeks. And so we're all taking a different chapter and um, yeah, but there's lots of stuff. And in fact, there was, um, Chef Alicia Watson is a local chef here, but she was just on this reality TV show, Big Restaurant Bet, and she was the only vegan and she won. And so she won like a quarter of a million dollar prize to like start some big plant-based venture. So it's, it's really taken off. And I try to really emphasize to people in addition to all of the environmental benefits and the benefits of not eating all these animals, that especially in the South where we are drowning in chronic disease, like this is an excellent way to treat chronic disease and decrease the cost to society that it has. So do you know the lady that won the, the show? Do you know her? Her name is, oh yes. Yeah, she, in fact, she catered my first class. The first class I ever did, she catered the meals. So yeah, maybe, we've collaborated on it. Maybe you could introduce us so that she could be on the show and tell her story. Oh, I'd love to. I, I totally will. Yeah. And she actually has, um, so she has a uh, little business where she does, um, she cooks like in a commercial kitchen and then delivers plant-based meals. And she has uh, a couple no oil options too, but they're really delicious. And they're all like really fresh, like grain bowls with, she shops all, uh, you know, organic uh, local foods too. So she gets most of her foods from the, from the farmer's market or local farmers. And then I'm going to tell you about the lion's mane too. This is from my friend, uh, Jess Wilkins with uh, Y Mountain Mushroom Farm, but, and he, I, I don't, 
I think he was kind of plant. I mean, probably didn't eat much meat, but like we've just been next to each other at the farmer's market for so long. He is now whole food plant-based, no oil. <laughs> He's only 37, but like, so he makes some, um, like he makes a mix that's a lentil soup mix with mushrooms with no oil. Cause I keep telling him like what my students need is just easy convenience foods. And so like I work with different um, vendors at the farmer's market. Um, and there's another one, Rayleigh Narisi with uh, plant turkey is she's on PLA and T-A-R-C-H-Y on Instagram. But um, she does a bunch of, uh, and, and like she figured out the no oil thing too. She's also certified with t Campbell. And um, she does um, like, like a no oil black bean brownie and we have a little store that we even sell this stuff at a green corner store on south main but yeah there's there's just like a whole lot of stuff sprouting up and Rayleigh makes like no oil hummus and so I have a Little Rock whole food plant-based no oil shopper that's what it's called Facebook page and that's where I post everything I find that is legit for anyone that's like trying to reverse their diabetes so it's it's a no oil you know so I don't like I'd love to highlight all the amazing, cause there are a lot of amazing vegan things in restaurants, but the vast majority is oil. So I save my stuff for just like any no oil stuff I can find. So it's coming along, it's, it's pretty exciting. So yeah, let me tell you, let's go on to the lion's mane. I had to uh, blow up the recipe and tape it to the wall with my, plant-based nutrition didn't cure my need for bifocals, unfortunately. So still got that. All right. so right here this is lion's mane mushroom and lion's mane is really amazing it's um it's got all sorts of uh brain benefits like in it's, it's studies have shown it's got improved like focus and uh improved memory but uh yeah it's an amazing thing and plus mushrooms and i'll tell you this story really quick Are we still doing okay on time i'm gonna I'm going to tear this up while i'm telling you the story but um what we're going to do lion's mane is really meaty tasting. And I've even had customers that I've talked to that they're vegan. And I talk about like lion's mane mushroom and they'll say, oh, I can't eat lion's mane because it tastes too much like meat <laughs> when you saute it. I'm like, well, that's a good problem for most people. But we're going to just rip this up into little pieces that um, are going to resemble crab. Okay. Can you see that? Okay. See that's there? so cool. Yeah. But it's just like little crab-like pieces. And, um, and then we're gonna saute it. But what I want to tell you about mushrooms is they have this property called anti-angiogenesis. And this is really important. This is the thing that really convinced me about plant-based nutrition. Um, when I first kind of heard about it and then I started researching it more, I heard Dr. Joel Furman um, do a discussion about insulin-like growth factor one. And why is animal protein bad for us? Because people always think, you know, like, well, plant protein, like you might survive, but it's not as good as meat, right? No, this is not the case. When we eat animal protein, the, the way animal protein is configured, it's got really high levels of all the essential amino acids. These are amino acids that we have to get from food. And all protein is made up of 20 different amino acids. 11 our bodies make nine of these amino acids we have to get from food. And so all animal protein has really high levels of the nine essential amino acids, which is why when they discovered protein in the 1800s, they thought that means that animal protein is the best protein there is because the, these amino acid levels are so high, right? And so that's kind of been our operating principle for 150 years, that, that animal protein is a superior protein. But um, what we know, especially from the China study, is that plant protein really has all of those nine essential amino acids, but sometimes the amounts of those amino acids are very low, like lysine and methionine frequently are very low. And so initially, you know, without doing um, population studies, researchers thought, well, that must be bad because if something is essential, if it's required to make a complete protein, you want a lot of it. Well, what they found is that when you eat animal protein, these high levels of amino acids make your liver kick out um, this thing called insulin-like growth factor one, it's a hormone. And high levels of IGF-1 contribute to cancer growth. Why is that? That's because 
high levels of IGF-1 from animal protein consumption, that's greater than 10% of caloric intake basically, that's gonna make your liver wanna kick out high levels of IGF-1, which is gonna make your body want to be in a blood vessel growing mood, okay? And angiogenesis, angio means blood vessel, genesis means creation of. And so if you have a little cancer stem cell that's lodged in your abdomen somewhere, what does it need to grow? It needs a blood supply, okay? So if, it ha if your body's got high levels of IGF-1 in the bloodstream, your body's going to want to grow a lot of little capillaries to feed that cancer cell and cancer cells have IGF-1 receptors on them. Okay. So they're just waiting for that IGF-1 so they can grow, grow, grow. We all, it's, this is an important understanding to have that we all have cancer. We all have little cancer cells in us. What matters when we say we got cancer, that means it was detected on a scan and it frequently takes eight to 10 years of these little cancer cells doubling and doubling to be visible to the human eye. Okay. I'm halfway through my lion's mane right now, but, <laughs> but um, so yeah, what we want is to have, if we have a cancer stem cell in our body, we want it to double very slowly. If, if at all, we would like it to stop growing. How can we do that? We can eat a diet with a protein profile, meaning plant protein, that will give us low levels of IGF-1. So when we eat, our, when we get our protein from plants, and to be clear, all plants have fat, protein, and fiber. So, you know, like in fifth grade, we were taught meat is only fiber and plants are carbs and fat is fat. It's not like that. The plants have all of that. But so all plants have protein, but the kind of protein they have is the kind that does not make our body create these cancer causing conditions like high IGF-1. So Dr. William Lee is a Harvard cancer researcher. And he said that um, he, he specializes in the field of anti-angiogenesis. And he says that if you have a cancer cell nestled in your body and it never gets a blood supply, okay? So if you're eating only plant protein and your body isn't gonna have high levels of IGF-1, then that little cancer cell per Dr. Lee will never get any bigger than two millimeters. Are you gonna die if you have a two millimeter cancer cell? No, <laughs> nope. You can have all the two millimeter cells you want. The problem is when they double and double and double and then after 20 years or after, that's why most people get cancer when they're in their 50s, 60s, 70s because those tumor cells have been doubling, doubling, doubling. They'll double quickly if our protein source is all animal protein. They will double very slowly, if at all, if we're eating mostly plant protein. So when I heard this explanation from Dr. Joel Furman, I still remember where I was in my car. It's like you remember where you were when JFK was shot or whatever. I remember exactly what exit I was at. I stopped and I replayed it and I listened again. And that's when I realized humans just aren't designed to eat animal protein. It's not that I used to always think, cause like in cardiology, we always have, you know, like all my patients have had heart attacks and I'm wondering like, you know, we all know it's the food. So I had this theory, I was kind of like a Michael Pollan follower. And I had the theory that like, oh, the problem is all the, the corn fed beef. You know, if we just fed the cows grass, and had like traditional agricultural practices, then we wouldn't have as much inflammation, wouldn't have as high, you know, omega-6 levels or whatever. But once I heard this IGF-1 explanation, I realized it doesn't matter. Uh, you know, you could sing lullabies to this cow. It could be fed grass. It's still a complete animal protein, no matter how perfectly and organically it's raised, it's always going to promote high levels of IGF-1. And this is what the whole problem is with uh, cancer promotion. And then also we know that it causes heart disease and all these other things too. So why is she saying this while she's ripping up lion's mane mushrooms? That is because <laughs> mushrooms have anti-angiogenetic properties, meaning that mushrooms have the capability of retracting all these little blood vessels. Okay. So when my husband first got his diagnosis of the diabetes, he went to the doctor because he had all these fatty tumors in his belly. 
And, um, and a lot of people do like, or you have fatty tumors on your arm or whatever. And he had gone to the doctor before and they say, it's just a fatty tumor. It's, it's benign. There's nothing to do with it. We don't need to do anything. But, um, yeah, he got to where he was like, they're just, they're growing and growing and I can't stand it anymore. And, um, so of course the doctor's like, there's nothing we can do, but then we switched to a plant-based diet and he had probably like 20, you could, he could just feel all these tumors in his belly. We switched to a plant-based diet and within about three months, these fatty tumors just shrunk up and went away. And that's because the blood supply got retracted. And if they don't get a blood supply, then they might as well just shrivel up and die. So that's what we want to happen with our cancer cells. But uh, yeah, that was the, that was the explanation that made me think, I don't need to eat any more animal protein. <laughs> like there is no ice cream or cheese that is worth in stage cancer. I used you to set to, people up on working pumps. With you want to hear something interesting, Stephanie? Yeah. So, cause you mentioned actual cancer tumors going away. My husband had a, I, I don't know if it was called a tumor something. I think it was called a lipoma. It's like, yes, a fatty a lipoma. Cyst. so yeah. it wasn't cancerous, but it was unsightly because he's a very lean guy and he had this, you know, like it looked like if you were to take a tennis ball and cut it in half and that was on his back. So it's like, he had this skinny guy with like this big bump on his back. And the doctor said, Oh, it's no big deal. It's, you know, fatty tumor. It's a lipoma. Mm -hmm. He's very lean. And he was vegan, but when we went oil free, you know, completely SOS free on August 1st, 2008, yeah. Within months, I mean, it disappeared. And it was like the size of half the size of a tennis ball. And it you know, went down to maybe the size of a nickel. It's, it's completely gone now. I mean, yeah. and isn't that wild? It's just amazing. And but, so I thought, yeah. it's, it's funny because when you told that story, I thought, well, God, if, if amazing what it could do for, you know, like a non-cancerous growth, right. I mean, who knows what it might do for cancer. Right. And another thing I'll recommend for people that are interested in learning more about this protein Google uh, on YouTube, Dr. Milton Mills, it's called protein chemistry for understanding nutrition or something. And he goes into this in depth and it is fascinating, but yeah. And, and he talks about, uh, yeah, just how like animal protein just makes us want to build cancers. It causes like fatty, uh, fatty tumors, skin tags, fibrocystic breast disease. Like it, it can promote cancer, but also promotes just excessive growing, even prostate. Like, so most older men have BPH, benign prostatic hyperplasia, just an enlarged prostate. It's not cancer necessarily. You switch to a plant-based diet, this, and, and it's like, you know, it sits over the urethra. So it pinches off their ability to go to the bathroom. Lots of times it's just like a donut around the urethra. And um, you go on a plant-based diet, it just can finally, like it shrinks and it can relax. And that's why, you know, like most older men are on some kind of prostate medicine, <laughs> it seems. And yeah, so my dad was quickly able to go off of his prostate medicine after he switched to a plant-based diet, just for that reason. Like this big and large thing just was finally able to shrink back down because we're switching to plant protein. So yeah, it's crazy. All right, so now I'm going to fire up my... Uh, lion's mane. And so what we're going to do, you always want to cook um, mushrooms, always. Uh, don't eat them raw because they are not good for you if they're raw. But um, so we're just going to toss it in here and it just takes a few minutes. Let's see here. I just got this new oven and the burners are really nice, but they're hotter than what I'm used to. So yeah, it just takes a little bit. The lion's mane is gonna shrink by about half after we cook it up. And it's just, the texture is amazing, but they're just all mushrooms. They're just gonna start to sweat and that's how they get their, their texture. So yeah, we'll just toss this around for a little bit. It's gonna take a little bit. Do we have any other questions? Uh, somebody was asking if in the smoothie, they could just use water. Oh, absolutely. You could just use water. And so. Elizabeth wanted to know where you bought the, the cereal. And I, I've seen it at Whole Foods and Sprouts and even online. Yeah, they, uh, they have it at my Kroger's even. But yeah, Kroger's, Whole Foods. Um, yeah. Yeah. And yeah, I'm sure you can get it online. It is kind of expensive. It's like $6.99 or so. But to me... I mean, yes, I guess I have the use of my arms. Theoretically, I could make it, but there's no way I would ever have time to do that. And it's just, 
it's just so nice to have crunch, you know, when you're oil free. And it's yeah, it's a real treat. All right, so we're starting, we're starting to shrink down a little bit here on the lion's mane. We actually have a restaurant in town. Um, or it's gonna be their food truck that's gonna be a restaurant called El Sur. It's like they specialize in Honduran food and they make uh, tacos with lion's mane. It's delicious. Um, yeah, so we're gonna do this. Tell you what, I'm gonna talk about uh, the next couple things on this recipe while I'm waiting for that to cook. See if I can do two things at once. So one of the things we're gonna put in this, um, in the lion's mane crab cakes to make it stick is uh, vegan mayo, okay? And so I made this, I prepped it and did mise en place in case I can't talk and measure at the same time. But um, so what this is, is four ounces of silken tofu. And um, you need like extra firm silken tofu. If your store doesn't have extra firm, you can just do that little Greek yogurt trick. <laughs> like just put it in a colander with some cheesecloth, put your just regular, like we just have regular silken tofu. And then I just press it through and let, let the water come out to get it more extra firm. So you get your silken tofu and then one teaspoon of red wine vinegar, one teaspoon of lemon juice, and then you need to really whisk it for like a few minutes. It's, and what I did, I always hate those recipes where they say like, make up this whole batch of vegan mayo and then you're gonna use one tablespoon, you know, and then you don't. So I prorated it down to where it's just the amount you're gonna use, but it's hard to put it in the blender because it's such a small amount, it just goes against the side and that's it. So I whisked it by hand, but you have to really whisk it uh, really well. So when you're making this at home, start with the vegan mayo first, and then you want to stick it in the fridge and let it kind of, um, you know, firm up a little bit while you're doing the mushrooms and everything else. And we are starting to shrink on down here. Mushrooms just will release their liquid. And even like a regular chef, I think, says like, you don't need to ever saute mushrooms. Like you can always dry saute them. Uh, that's what we want them to do because we want them to kind of cook in their own juices. But yeah, they're starting to release their juice now. Remember Julia Child said, uh, don't <laughs> crowd the mushrooms. So I've got just enough room for them all. Um, but, um, but yeah, so after we get this done, then we're gonna just combine all our other ingredients in the food processor. And mm. here's a question. Carol said yeah. the soybeans that you cooked in your smoothie, were they cooked? Yes, they are cooked. Okay. And uh, yeah, I just cooked those up in the instant pot. And to be clear, like most of y'all, I was, I talked to Karen before the show to ask her what the deal is. Basically she can't sell her soybeans across state lines for some reason. So most people are going to get their soybeans from edamame in the store, you know, like those green like Asian soybeans. Um, to be clear, the edamame in the store is parboiled. It is not uh, fully cooked. So you don't want to like just pull the soybeans out of the edamame bag and put them in your smoothie. You need to cook them in boiling water for five minutes. And so like I just do like if I'm using edamame, I just do that once a week. I just chuck it in some boiling water, then uh, drain it in the colander after five minutes, and then I just put it in a bag. And then I just pull that out for my smoothie the rest of the week. But yeah, they are not cooked. All right, so let's see. We've got our vegan mayo. We got our, okay, now here's what we're gonna do. I'm gonna get my food processor. Okay, and this lion's mane crab cake recipe is really a nutritionally superior recipe. I'm very proud of it. So it's also got chickpeas that kind of hold everything together. So what we're gonna do, we're going to, it calls for one cup of chickpeas, but what I'm gonna do is put like a little bit of the chickpeas in, all right? Then we are going to do a mixture. And here's the deal. I sound like Joe Biden, here's the deal. When we're eating all our standard American junk like mayo and everything like that, 
it's really useful making crab cakes stick together if you're using eggs and mayo and everything, but you're going to end up having terrible heart disease. So the benefits of plant-based nutrition, we have all sorts of health benefits, but it's a little tricky getting crab cakes to stick together without mayo. So I'm going to show you what I got here. Um, we are going to start out with, um, we're going to use a quarter cup of aquafaba from the chickpeas. And aquafaba is just the juice that's in the chickpeas. And I've already dumped it out. But so when you're opening and like the best way to make this is with a can of chickpeas. So you're going to open up the lid and then drain the brine, the juice into a bowl. Okay. And then you're going to use a quarter cup of that aquafaba. So what we're going to do is we're going to mix aquafaba with some tapioca starch and water, okay? And uh, the reason I'm doing this is I'm making a little slurry that's gonna try to help bind together the ingredients in the crab cake, okay? I actually call the chef at one of our local restaurants, which has a bunch of vegan options. It's called The Root. Chef John helped me with this tapioca starch idea. My son actually works there too, but they have they have some amazing vegan dishes. Um, they're not all, well, one is oil-free, the pea stew, but everything else not, but it's delicious. Um, so this is tapio one tablespoon of tapioca starch, one tablespoon of water, okay? It's kind of like cornstarch, you just gotta whisk it up, okay? Here's my quarter cup of aquafaba, all right? So I'm mixing that all together, okay? This is the liquid that's gonna go in here, okay? So a crab cake is kind of similar to like a, a bean burger or a veggie burger, right? It's the same idea. Okay, so I'm gonna pulse this up, but I'm I'm gonna pulse this pretty good because I want it to be more uh, sticky to like hold things. Ugh, I'm doing this backwards. Let me see if I can figure out how to put this on. There we go. Okay. All right, cover your ear. So I blended this up a whole lot because I want it to be um, kind of more sticky, right? But then like the original recipe that I got this from, which was not no oil, says just pulse the chickpeas five times. So I'm gonna put the remaining chickpeas in, but I don't want them to be, you know, obliterated. So we're just gonna do a little gentle pulse five times, okay? Done, okay? because we still want to have that texture in the crab cakes. Then, so here's my lion's mane. Can you see that there? After it's cooked, it's like half the size. So now I'm going to put that in here, and then we're going to do the same thing. We're going to do five pulses and just get it combined. Yeah, this is a really good dish for vegan skeptics that think that vegan food is no good. It's a good company dish. Yes, that's exactly what I want. Let me show you. I don't know if you can see this. It totally looks like crab. Isn't it crazy? That's incredible. And, and it's amazing. The texture is just amazing. Okay, so now what we're going to do is we're going to mix that mixture with all the rest of our ingredients. So I just get a spatula and you want to be sure and kind of get all that liquid out, all that good aquafaba. All right. Okay, so now let's see, we are going to combine everything else now. So we're gonna put in, this is Old Bay seasoning. This is what you have to have with crab cakes. And I know the question they're gonna ask you, Chef AJ, regarding Old Bay seasoning. Does it have salt? Yes, okay, so Old Bay seasoning has this is one teaspoon, okay? So it has 
basically, I did the math. It's going to have 80 milligrams of sodium per, per serving. Okay. Is that a problem? Do you want to hear my explanation on what do we need to worry about with sodium? This is what I did for 20 years. I specialize in low sodium and keeping you out of the hospital with a low sodium diet. So um, there is no such thing as a zero milligram sodium diet, okay? All living things, everything that grows out of the ground, every fresh fruit and vegetable contains sodium. Our bodies require sodium. We are in big trouble <laughs> if we don't get enough sodium, okay? However, most Americans are getting way too much sodium because we have so much processed food. The average American gets about 3,500 milligrams of sodium a day, okay? Depending on how much junk you eat. So in the cardiology world, we try to restrict our patient's sodium because they're all, they all have high blood pressure or heart failure or whatever. Um, really the strictest sodium restriction we can conceive of in the cardiology world is a 1500 milligram sodium restriction per day. Okay. Never, never, never try to get down to zero milligrams of sodium or you'll die. Okay. You need sodium. So generally we say 1500 milligrams. That's even Dr. Esselstyn's sodium restriction is 1500 milligrams a day. If you are on a whole food plant-based diet, eating things that grow out of the ground, you will generally only get about five to 600 milligrams of sodium a day from your fresh fruits, vegetables, whole grains, and legumes, okay? So that leaves you about like maybe 900 milligrams of sodium wiggle room, okay? And so like, you know, different things we eat, like 80 milligrams of sodium per crab cake can easily fit into a low sodium diet, especially if you're on a whole food plant-based diet. Like I used to struggle to get my patient, I'd make them keep a food diary and show me their sodium content every day. It's hard when you're eating <laughs> a standard American diet food to keep your sodium low. It's just not hard when you're on a plant-based diet. So you can generally allow yourself a little bit of sodium. Ask your doctor, and if you have a question about how much sodium you should be, what your sodium intake should be, ask your doctor, okay? Um, but you have to be careful about being uh, kind of crazy overzealous with low sodium, especially if you go on a plant-based diet. Um, if you're taking like diuretics or something, diuretics work by pulling sodium out of your bloodstream and into your kidney and then the water follows. And so you can even become, have too low of a uh, um, blood sodium level. And that's a big problem if that happens. So just check with your doctor. But um, when you switch to a plant-based diet, um, you will find that like the sodium thing just kind of falls into place. And you don't have to be as like paranoid about sodium anymore as, as you do when you're eating sausage biscuits and cornbread and stuff like that. Cause you're always, your baseline is really high. Okay. So uh, let's see, I put my old base seasoning in. Now I'm going to mix in three quarters cup of breadcrumbs and guess what breadcrumbs I used? Ezekiel bread. Okay. So Ezekiel bread is about two slices of Ezekiel bread is about three quarters of a cup. Okay. So you just uh, toast it, put it through food processor, but here we go. Here's our Ezekiel bread. Okay. And then we're going to have, let me get the rest of my goodies here. Then we're going to mix in some um, garlic and celery and a scallion. It just adds really good crunch and texture. Where is my knife? Ah, here it is. And if you're switching to a plant-based diet, this is what I recommend. Treat yourself and go get a good Asian knife. Asian knives have a much sharper blade for cutting vegetables and the knife we had our whole life was a European blade. The Europeans are for uh, European blades for meat mostly. So this, just gonna chop up the scallion here. I've got my husband sharpen these knives. You can sharpen them on a whetstone also. So you get a good knife. You can just keep sharpening it for life. Here's our scallion. And then we're going to do celery. I like to just, you can get it. I, I'm cutting it in half. I want it to be kind of diced, I guess, is where we want this. I don't want it too huge. 
but this is just gonna, uh, when you taste this, it is, it is just so delicious. It is a real treat. Okay, so there's that. And then we're gonna do two cloves of garlic. I'm not a professional chef, you know, so it might take me a little bit. You got any other medical questions? Not a medical question, <laughs> but a question from Mona about maybe using dulse granules instead of the Old Bay. Um, I imagine you could. So I'll tell you, the secret to Old Bay seasoning is celery salt. Well, which is probably where the salt comes in. But um, yeah, everything else is proprietary. But you, you could use probably anything you want. But yeah, that dulse might give it kind of like a seaweedy flavor too. You can maybe also put, um, I'm not sure, is there like seaweed granules or something you could maybe put in? I mean, I guess that's what the dulse is, is it's kind of like kelp, isn't it? I believe so. Yeah, sea vegetable. Yeah. But yeah, you, you absolutely can. Yeah, if you are zero milligrams of sodium, you can certainly do that. And it's got garlic. Um, and then, you know, you've got your lemon juice and everything with the uh, vegan mayo and the red wine vinegar. Okay. And so, yeah, we're not going back in the food processor again, where you're just simply combining all these remaining ingredients. So, Stephanie, when you were working like on, in with cardiac care, what was the diet that they recommended? Like if people had congestive heart failure or, or had a heart attack? Let me because tell you, Chef AJ, it's called a heart healthy diet. Okay. So a heart healthy diet is anywhere from 1500 to 2000 milligrams of sodium a day. And then we just like, if you, if you ask someone like, what's a heart healthy diet, they'd be like, oh, um, like all we really can conceive of is like, just stop eating fast food. It's like boneless, skinless chicken breast, low fat milk, um, salmon on your salad. So that's what happens. People are compulsively switching to these turkey wraps, you know, it, and what they don't understand is like with a disease of fat toxicity, which I explain this all in my course too like diabetes or heart disease, we simply can't be getting by even a healthy standard American diet, which American Heart Association diet is a standard American diet, but with different kinds of meat, basically. So they discourage red meat, but encourage white meat and seafood. Um, but to reverse diseases of fat toxicity, we really need to get down like Dr. Esselstyn's diet, which is the most effective diet for heart disease reversal, uh, 40 times more effective than a Mediterranean diet, that is a 10% fat diet, okay? So even if you're doing like a quote unquote heart healthy uh, diet, which is what we recommend, that's going to be still about 30% fat, but you're just getting different kinds of fat. Instead of the red meat, you're getting all your chicken and you're gonna slavishly eat chicken and turkey and all that stuff. So um, yeah, and and, that's why I think cardiologists and a lot of people in the medical field are not that excited about nutrition is <laughs> because the nutrition that we recommend never works. It doesn't ever do anything. But once you see the effects of plant-based nutrition, you're just so excited because it, 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 it doesn't cost anything. No one has a patent on it and it, it just changes people's lives. So yeah, it's pretty amazing. All right, now we're gonna put in, let's see the rest of our, Ingredients. So I mixed in the celery, the scallion, the old bay, the garlic. Now we're going to put a half of a lemon. So I just use this little lemon juicer. I got a half of a lemon and cut that in half. So we're going to squeeze our lemon juice in. Okay. And then we're going to put our mayo and Dijon mustard. And mustard is always a really good uh, lower sodium. I probably shouldn't do this live. Okay, sodium 120 more. Yeah, but um, mustard is always, uh, it's a good low fat option too. Okay, so here's our vegan mayo. I'm gonna put that in and then I've got a tablespoon of Dijon mustard. 
Well, my spoon doesn't fit. Hold on. You said something to me before we logged on. I was hoping you would say about the medical field. Yeah. <laughs> oh, well, like you're surprised that they don't promote health. Right. Um, so, I mean, and I don't want to diss, you know, the entire medical field writ large, but, um, you know, I got to a point in my career where I was just not particularly happy. And I've always been interested in nutrition. I just never knew about plant-based nutrition because how would you ever find out if you're in the medical field, right? So, <laughs> yeah, I mean, and I started really thinking like, why, why am I so unhappy? And I'm like, you know, like, if you're unhappy, you need to accurately assess the situation. What hospitals do, um, hospitals are reimbursement code implementers, okay? <laughs> and Medicare will put out a reimbursement code for every procedure, for every single thing, and then third-party insurance follows it. And um, we just need to be clear, like, you don't want to have, and even if you're plant-based, there may be an occasion in which you need to have surgery, right? You don't want to go to some strip mall and have surgery. You don't want to go to Bob's bypasses, <laughs> right? In some like a little pop-up shop. You need, we need hospitals, right? We, we need these things, but uh, they are basically geared around a reimbursement model. And if something is reimbursable, no one's going to be opposed to it, Right. So it's, it's hard, and, and that's what Dr. Ornish said when he first uh, did his uh, lifestyle heart trial. He was just surprised that it didn't take off. Well, there's no reimbursement for it. And it, it, things are not esteemed in the medical field unless they are profitable. And it's a for-profit system. So, you know, it's not that the individuals in the medical system are bad people, it's the system. Um, it simply does not incentivize prevention by using natural methods, even if they're research backed. Um, and, and what we do is we have a seven minute office visit and physicians need to get you through in a short period of time because they make very little money on office visits. And um, they can make 50 times the amount of your office visit with a 30 minute procedure in the cath lab. And that's not to say every single procedure is, is a scam or not needed. But um, there's no incentive in the medical field. And so, and I'm a member of the American College of Lifestyle Medicine as well. And that's something that they really work on is trying to work with um, different hospitals, different uh, you know, uh, insurance providers to come up with a different system, which we kind of call value-based care in which physicians are rewarded for treating the cause of the problem and, and doing education. And that's, that's what I used to do a lot in um, heart failure. I found that the most effective thing I could do to keep my patients out of the hospital was to get them to truly switch to a, to a um, low sodium diet. I didn't know about plant-based nutrition at the time. So I would spend a lot of time uh, talking to them about their diet, but there's, there's no money in that. So then I'd make videos I, cause I like, I don't have time to talk. So everyone needs the same information. That's how I came up with the idea for my course. Like <laughs> just make a video <laughs> and, um, yeah. So, but that's what we need to do is you have to change the system to not being a pure profit driven, uh, fee for service model. And, and I think pretty much everyone is aware that this needs to change you would find very few people in the medical field today that say like, oh no, this is a great system. It's not a great system and we all know it. So, all right. So now what we're gonna do, we're gonna put our, let me double check. All right, folks. Yes, I got everything in. Okay, now we're gonna put these into a ring mold. And you may think like, oh, I can just mold them with my hand. Yeah, you could do it with your hand if you had eggs and mayo, but this doesn't have that. So you really need to use the ring mold. Um, and this is like, a, I think it's a two and a half inch ring mold. You can get it like on Amazon or maybe at like a specialty store. So I'm just going to spoon that in. How are we doing on time, Chef AJ? Well, I have to teach for Dr. Alviera pretty soon. So if you could wind it up maybe in the next okay. 10 minutes. Say what, I'm just going to do one. So there we go. All right. And then we're going to Okay, we are going to cook this on low heat, all right? Um, 
So I'm just gonna, and when you press it down, it makes it more firm, right? And I'm just gonna, can you let me move this here? There we go. And then I'm gonna hold that down and lift the ring up, okay? And there we go. So now I'm going to, we're going to use the two spatula method because it is a little tricky and I'm just going to do full disclosure here. It may break. Okay. But if it does, um, you can just remold it when you flip it and it tastes amazing and you can just squish it into whatever shape you need. Okay. So here we go. Make sure that my heat right. All right. We're going to slide it into the pan. Okay, and this takes two minutes. I don't have my phone, which I was going to time myself with. Can't you ask Alexa to set a timer? My assistant there is going to time me for two minutes. Uh, but anyway, what we're going to do when this is done, we're going to serve it on a bed of arugula with some lemon wedges. And then also, if I'm going to not do this live since we're short on time, but also avocado. Just put some diced avocado on top lemon wedges, arugula, and it is absolutely delicious. Oh, I bet on a bed of arugula, yeah. Yeah, oh yeah, it's amazing. And, and the avocado just, uh, yeah, it's, it's absolutely so wonderful. While, while so, you're finishing up, tell people like how they can connect with you, what social media sites that yes. you like to so be on the most. In the show notes at the very top, I have the special for my course, the 21 day plant-based challenge. If you type in coupon code chef AJ live, you get 15% off. And then it also um, is going to include a, a free group zoom coaching session with me on, I think it's August 6th or August 4th. I can't remember, but I have it written in there. So as soon as you uh, purchase the course, you'll get an email with the zoom link for the coaching session. Um, but that's mainly what I do. Anyone that uh, enrolls in the course is also automatically going to be enrolled in our monthly support group that's just ongoing for all eternity. I even have plant-based mentors that will take you under their wing that you can just call up or email whenever you have a question. I have these ladies that are just like so on fire for plant-based nutrition. They just want to tell the world. But um, so there's that. I have, um, let me think, I have a bunch of links um, to like all the research I talked about. Uh, my Facebook page is natural state plant based. Type that in the search bar. But that's I, actually, where I, well, I actually did clickable links for everything you gave me. Yes. I made them clickable. Good, good, good. So yeah, all those links are in the show notes. Um, and then I have a YouTube channel. Um, but yeah, that's, it's all in there. And my email is in there. So if you have any questions or anything, but yeah, I just like to work with, uh, my specialty is beginners. That's what I like is people that are just brand new to this. This is what I did for 30 years. I work with Arkansans that like <laughs> are very ill that just live the standard American Southern diet, which is even worse than the regular standard American diet. Mm -hmm. And two minutes. All right. Okay. So our time is up. So let me flip this. Here we go. Now we're going to do the two spatula method. Okay. Ah, it's still broke a little bit, but I'm just going to reform that. Okay. And it is nice and brown. Okay. Any other questions, Chef AJ? Let me look. Let me look. Uh, um, well, there was one on pancreatic cancer. I don't know if you can speak to that, if there's oh, any I, studies I mean, about it. Or... Yeah. I, I mean, generally, I think many cancers are very amenable to a plant-based diet, but in general, you don't, what you don't ever want to do, and I'll just put a disclaimer out there. Don't ever uh, think like, oh, I'm going to do this plant-based diet and throw all your pills out and throw all your doctors out. You want to remain on all your same pills. We're still going to do this under, and, and if you're taking a lot of meds, if you've kind of got a lot of um, different disease processes, you want to be under the supervision of your doctor. Um, especially when you switch to a plant-based diet, because things will improve so rapidly that we'll need to drop, we'll need to back down on your blood pressure pills and especially your diabetes pills. But um, as far as cancer goes, you need to still collaborate with your regular doctor. Um, you know, you can also seek the advice of, um, what is it, plantbasedtelehealth.net. That's Dr. Clapper's um, outfit, but they have like plant-based physicians 
that um, have a medical license in all 50 states. So you can get a doctor that um, you can get a plant-based opinion on. It's because sometimes, many times your regular doctor like will just need to down titrate your meds when you switch to a plant-based diet. But sometimes you may want the advice of a plant-based physician, a physician that specializes in plant-based nutrition and knows about that. Uh, in conjunction with your current doctor. So that's what I would recommend for that. All right, here we go. So uh, it's a little tricky getting this thing to stay together, but it's still gonna taste the same. So see that? There's our crab cake. Oh, gonna slide it off. And I'm just gonna reform it. No one needs to know. Boom. And there you go. Lion's mane crab cakes. Wow, that is beautiful, Stephanie. Well, there. You're going to write a cookbook? That is gorgeous. It's like it looked like a restaurant meal. It, it, it is delicious. And yeah, this is a great guess. I mean, like if you have family that's like, I don't know about this. I don't think I can do it. Just try that. And that's what I like to tell people too about plant-based nutrition. Don't think about like starting now, no meat or dairy until the end of time just start trying new plant-based dishes and like start off with a smoothie every day, then add in like hummus for lunch every day. And then pretty soon you just, you'll like the food. And then you've just chosen instead of just, you know, clenching your fists and avoiding, we're just going to choose new foods every day. And then it's, it's an easy way to transition. Wow. That's great. You are just a wonderful guest. Thank you so much for coming on. You betcha. You going to write a cookbook? Well, maybe someday I'll have to write a cookbook. And I, shoot, I could put my class into a book form. There you go. It's like Why not? Everything do, do, you need from do you, beginner. Are all through. your classes a, a, a virtual right now or do you ever teach in person? I do a live class. Like, for example, I'm doing a, um, I'm doing a class. There's, at, well, there's a restaurant in Searcy about an hour from here. It's called Smoothin' and Groovin'. It's all plant-based. And they, they actually don't even use hardly any oil. I'm going to do a little, like, beginner class there next week um, on July 26th. It's on Facebook. Just um, It's on my natural state plant-based. Um, but, yeah, it's just a one-hour um, introductory session uh, about like, you know, like the basics of what you need to know for like one hour and then we'll do Q and a afterwards, but like probably a, a few times a year, I'll do a live course, but, um, but otherwise it's all online. You know, that's fantastic. Well, thank you so much. You betcha. All right. That was a Thanks great for having me on, Chef it, it's My pleasure. And enjoy that delicious looking meal. I will. All right. And thanks all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Please come back tomorrow when my guest is Shane Sterling. He will be talking about how to build muscle on a raw vegan diet. Thanks for watching, everyone.